Welcome to episode 550 of the Barcelona Podcast, brought to you by the Blue Wire Podcast Network. I'm Dan Hilton, and here we are talking about another big game loss for Xavi and his squad. Right at the top, I want to say thank you for all the support and kind messages I've gotten across all the different channels and places this week. It has been so hard, honestly, for the last three years to wonder if it's me sometimes or is it the team? And those messages remind me that it's the team letting us down more than it is me letting you down. So let's find some positives in the latest letdown, but keep that frustration close to our hearts. Here's the five headlines from Barcelona's 4-2 loss to Athletic Club in the Copa del Rey quarterfinals. And last, but most importantly not least, subscribing. That's the easiest way and cheapest way to help the channel. Then, of course, Patreon, merch store, all that other good stuff. And I am only 50 followers or something away on that Twitter, well, X platform, whatever. So yeah, maybe help me get to 2,000 there. That's, again, free, easy to do. All right, five headlines time. Headline one is another response needed. Before we jump into the first minute of the game where there's obviously a goal, I was actually really surprised, and I got this one wrong. I was almost certain because Lamini Mall went 90 against Real Betis. I was almost certain that he would be rotated for this game, and we would see Jao Felix, who has not started other than the Copa matches against lower division sides here in January, which I think there are some alarm bells being rung about not necessarily if the club is going to buy Jao Felix and Juan Laporta and Mendes decide to go ahead with that deal, but that Xavi, at least this season, fighting for his job, does not trust Jao Felix as a part of his present or even potentially his future. So I was really surprised to see Lamine Mall not be rotated and be thrown right back into the fire, right back into the starting lineup, and especially with the atmosphere of San Mames. And as much as San Mames did give home field advantage for Athletic Club, it wasn't the likes of the teenagers, which will be a main theme throughout this five headlines. It wasn't the teenagers who seemed to be wide-eyed in front of that raucous crowd. It was some of the other players with a lot more experience under their belt. Enough preamble, 36 seconds in. What the hell? Very rarely do I use even the ounce of profanity that sometimes this team deserves. But to concede in the first minute, not the first time this season. Not the second time this season. Not the third time this season. But the fourth time this season in the first minute. Unfortunate for Lamini Mall, gives it away. De Young and Balde lose the 50 50. And then Adu Ares keeps it alive with a diving header. A lot of effort, of course, with that kind of atmosphere. You knew the Athletic Club was going to come out firing. And Guruzetta was unmarked, slammed it home. Courtesy our friends at Siempre Positivo, they had the stats ready to go for this goal. Courtesy Sam Marsden, one of the co hosts of that show. The Guru said that goal after 36 seconds, only the third earliest Bars have conceded this season. We're talking about the four in the first minute here. Granada after 17 seconds, Alavez after 18, Guru Zeta then after 36 seconds, and Antwerp after 75. That is too many times to give up a goal, not in the first one minute, or two minutes, or five minutes even. It, it's too much to give up in the first 10 minutes of a game in an entire season. And reviewing each and every one of those goals, I can point to individual errors or, or certain things. So it's not necessarily about the preparation for a match. I think it's just really unfortunate that Barca keeps making so many mistakes in the first gosh darn minute of the game. This is also the ninth match this season. Now this courtesy of Tony Juan Marti, also of San Positivo. Ninth match this season, which Barca has conceded the 1-0 lead before the 20th minute. That's 29% of total games. Barcelona have begun 13 games this season behind, but they have wound up winning or drawing in nine of them. This one, obviously, in La Liga would have been a draw, but it winds up being a loss. So that 69% does go down. I have a few positive things to say about the midfield in the first half, and those things largely turn negative there in the second half and extra time. So I'll get to the negative. But first, I think that we did find a fair balance with Pedri, De Jong, and Gunawan starting as that midfield trio. Obviously, it's the three, especially with Gabi out, you have to start. Those three just leagues better than Roberto and Oro Romeo, so you have to have them on the field to start these matchups, at least when Pedri is fit. But without a natural ball winner and the guy who you would expect to be in the buildup, or for Xavi's sake, in this system with all that possession, the pivot that you'd like to see. But without that, now you have to wonder, where do you get those three going forward? Who's best to go forward? And I think that's a question that Barcelona still has yet to answer. Pedri was deeper than Gundogan at times in the buildup, but that wasn't a constant. It felt like Pedri's positioning was higher again after the first goal was scored for Barcelona, so the changing of positions a bit. But then after the first half, all the things that I was wondering about that position, if anything, was on purpose. The heat map showed that 
I don't know if anything was on purpose because they were all pretty much even, but DeYoung was actually slightly ahead and Pedri was just barely the deepest there in that first half. And I know people have been calling for Pedri to be the deepest, but this wasn't necessarily anything on purpose. I think this was just the way the game was working, the way the game was flowing. And again, this positioning in the first half was not on purpose because instead of being positive and saying that all three Gundogan and De Jong and Pedri can contribute to the buildup in deeper positions and have things to offer going forward. It's more a matter that none of them are a ball winner. So to keep any bit of shape, they all have to do a job in deeper positions. And then they build up with whoever was the farthest one back when the center backs and outside backs are recycling the ball. Unfortunately, it took Barca about 11 minutes to settle into this game. Athletic Club were playing a 4-4-1-1 with Sunset underneath Garazetta. You could argue it's a 4-2-3-1 in buildup, and obviously they're defending in a 4-4-2, but we're splitting hairs with the formation. The story of Athletic Club was more about their press, their decisions on when to press, and their patience with that press, and trusting that they were going to be physical when the time came, using that 12th man of the fans behind them. Again, we're kind of foreshadowing the second half, but you can see that patience there in the first half, which, to that point, does allow Barcelona to come back in the game. 20th minute, more bad news. Balde with a really nice move, splits two, accelerated through the two players. And to see him against Real Betis, and then here today with that start, yeah, it was really positive stuff with him inverting off to the races, but definitely tore his hamstring. Now he's out for four to six weeks. That's it. And yeah, it's frustrating because not only these two matches, but I thought he had a good two weeks, honestly. And now he's on the sideline for four to six weeks. And it feels like all of the progress that he might have been making incrementally is just going to go down the tube. In comes, though, 17-year-old Hector Ford to play on his unnatural left side. Silver linings always when it comes to using academy kids. And this is another example. We'll talk about Hector Ford. Don't you worry. And the positivity began within a minute of him being on the field. Ford's first action for him was a mistake by Torres that he had to defend, and he was up to the challenge. Headline two is added to the highlight reel. Let's keep the positivity going before the negativity starts to creep in. 26th minute, it's 1-1, Christensen to Torres after Torres set up the move. It was a good job bringing it down by Torres. Really nice first touch to set himself up and get around the defender. Then the pass to Pedri bouncing around and Yuri fails to clear it. Lewandowski just puts a foot backwards and scores an absolutely ridiculous goal. Not necessarily in a complimentary way, but just sometimes things go right for you if you put yourself in the right spots. And Lewandowski finally putting himself in one of those right spots. It was his first open play goal on the road since August. Hopefully there are more of those, but that is a pretty incredible stat for Robert Lewandowski, who, yeah, you credit with the goal being in the right place at the right time and having good instincts, but this goal was built by Ferran Torres, and I know he goes missing after this moment, but it was nice to see that at least I can look at this whole total picture of a game and say, yes, there were times when he was floating and drifting in and out of this match, but he did at least have some kind of impact on it. Then we fast forward to the 32nd minute, and if I'm just trying to be positive and just trying to find silver linings, the 2-1, the Galazzo from Lamine Yamal, it was the happiest I've seen the Barca fan base, at least online, being in quite a while. <laughs> it's been a while, and that's what young kids scoring goals does for you. And what a goal this is, too. It's a goal that shows his potential. It's a goal that shows what his ceiling is and why he is such an exciting prospect. I really want to break this down, too, because this is why Lamine Yamal is a top prospect. Wonderful turn of his hips on the initial pass to let the ball roll into his path. Very much like against Real Betis when he allowed that ball, as I mentioned, when he was holding off the defender for that one shot, where he lets the ball roll across him to get onto his natural left foot. And even though he's adept at using his right foot as well, his left foot is so good that he's able to get to full speed with one touch and set himself up. So he gets to top speed very quickly by taking that ball onto his left, pushing it forward to get by the first man. Then he kept that top speed because his technical ability and close ball control is so good. So he kept that top speed to take on Pereira as a center back. One move because of the speed he's moving and he sets up his shot, which is then finished wonderfully. A really good high level goal that not many players, I'm not talking about teenagers, but I know it looks easy, but the way he glides and the way he set all that up at top speed, not many players in world football can do that, let alone teenagers. So that is why I'm not jumping the gun. I'm, again, just talking about that goal. That is the kind of goal that reminds you why he's a top prospect. He becomes the youngest player to score in Copa del Rey, which I almost said that in the wrong tone. That's a pretty incredible stat. He also became the youngest player for Barcelona to score in the Supercopa. This is for Barcelona, not overall. He's also the youngest player for Barcelona to score in the Liga. That's what he is. This kid is a prodigy. And I was talking to a friend of the show, Rory Barlow, on social media that why do we always have to bring up the age? Well, we do because very much like older players, 
you know, like Messi's final seasons and even Busquets' final season, where I tell you, the legends of the game in their late 30s don't take them for granted. I want to say the opposite thing with these teenagers. Every good performance they have is just a moment in time. We don't know what the future holds for any of these kids. So while they're setting these records, because they are, Lamini Mall is going to be in the record books now for maybe the next hundred years. I mean, who knows with the Academy, but he's breaking records that have stood for a very long time with just how good he is at the young age that he is. So as this moment in time, it's really, really incredible. And we can worry about his future and his ceiling and comparisons like that when it comes. Headline three is the kids kept Barca in it. I'll continue to be reckless and you can call it hype or whatever it is, but I'm trying to be realistic at how exciting. And I've been telling you for months and with this group, I even feel like it's been a few years now. This is a really, really talented group. 37th minute, it's a tremendous cross from Fort to Lewandowski that gets knocked out for a corner kick. Fort was fantastic. From not knowing if he was going to play or likely not playing in that match at all, depending on how it was going to go, to being asked to come in just about 20 minutes in, and to be as good as he was playing on his unnatural side, playing as a left back when he's a natural right back. The craziest part of Ford's performance to me isn't even about him. It's about the fact that Mark Yu, Kubarsi, Lamine Mall, and Fort, they have all exceeded, exceeded. You can go back at my La Masia stuff, and I always try to tamper expectations with these kind of kids because I've watched over this last, how many years you've been with me? Seven years now? How many of them have just failed to be the kid where you get so excited about I don't want to throw any names out, but even a Chus Albo, who's a currently a free agent, having not worked out in, what was it, the second division in Italy. So you never know. These kids look really exciting at 16 and then 17 and 18, and you never know which of the kids. But this group has been so interesting because even when they were 14, 15, 16, you're like, oh, wait, that's the kid. This kid is so far beyond his other teammates, even though some of them were teammates at the lowest levels, but they were so far beyond what a regular player at their positions were. And I figured, well, maybe they'd get a taste of the first team, hopefully this season, because they really are these top prospects. But they're now in the first team dynamic and performing for the first team. As far as my expectations for each of those four names I gave you, for what their roles and performances have been this season, they have all exceeded those expectations. And that's not even to speak of Fermi Lopez, who wasn't even supposed to be in the first team picture when he was coming back from Linares on loan and is now a part of the first team dynamic completely. It's supposed to be, and Frances Tomas, we go back to the second or third show when Frances first had that line. You can expect one kid every year or two, but this generation, it's supposed to be, as Frances said, 0.5 to one La Masia kid per season. I'm of the age where it was Roberto, and then it was a long time, <laughs> and then you're looking at Carlos Salanya, and you're just hoping that somebody else winds up breaking into the first team from the academy, and now you have this huge generation of kids, basically starting with the Balde and Gabi, who are major parts of the first team. And it isn't supposed to work this way, but it worked the same way with Balde too. Fort has been just as good as a left back with the first team as he's been with Barca Athletic at his natural right back. It doesn't make sense, it's not supposed to work that way, but here we are. I know I'm jumping around here a bit more than I usually do, but jumping ahead to the second half, when Araujo goes down with that knee injury, obviously at that point, I'm like, oh no, he's joining Gabi on the sideline for the next year. We're not going to see Araujo. What is Barcelona going to do? You think they've got a transfer plan, and now they might have to go after a center back. All that different stuff when he went down the 70th minute. But instead, it's Christensen coming out for Gabarsi. Araujo seems like it was an earlier knock in the game that is probably just going to be bruised all heck tomorrow, and he might even get rotated on the weekend too. Christensen, though, still not healthy, dealing with his injury. Inigo Martinez still out. So here comes Pau Gabarsi as Araujo's hobbling, staying on, and staying behind him. And I did go long on Gabarsi on both the podcast that came out on Monday night, as well as the match review against Real Betty. So I've done enough Kabarsi talk, but even in extra time and the second half, his line-breaking pass and his passing, it is just another level. He really is already at the level that Eric Garcia was for this team last season. Defensively and his ball-playing ability, it's where Eric Garcia was last season. So for Kabarsi, instead of trying to compare him, I, I said he does have a lot of Christensen in his game, and maybe it's helped that he's next to Araujo as the left center back. But his ceiling obviously is sky high, but it feels like his floor is Eric Garcia. And for people who have heard me defend Eric Garcia for what was all of last season and the things that he could do and couldn't do, if your floor is Eric Garcia, you've got a pretty good future ahead of you. 42nd minute, Iñaki Pena stood strong with the quick reflexes. He's a shot stopper. I've been saying it for weeks. It's a bit of luck, but you take it. And a minute later, Fort with a stand-up tackle that was just chef's kiss. Love it from Fort. 45 plus four, Barca almost get their third. 
Laminia Mall to Torres, back to Laminia Mall. The shot was blocked, and Gundogan was offside. But if he wasn't, Torres forced a really tough save by Aguirre Zabala. And that's about our day. Say what you will about his Barcelona career, but he has been the man for Athletic Club. They have just been a perfect pair with Valverde returning to Athletic Club. And he makes a halftime change, went with an attacking midfielder for a defensive midfielder, swapping out Vezga for Une Gomez, which is another one of those kids. So Athletic Club, they were also relying on talented kids to get it done. And that's why Athletic Club, Real Madrid, Barcelona, they have never seen the second division because Athletic Club, even though they only use players related to the Basque country, they have a top academy that, in particular, produces fantastic goalkeepers year in and year out. But they have a lot of young talent, and they use all that money from selling talent to reinforce in the academy and go after the guys they have to. One of those academy kids, by the way, Sunset, with the equalizer in the 49th, and how quickly things change. In the first half, Jules Kunde and Araujo, I thought, were really good against Nico Williams. I didn't say his name at all in the first half. And then the second half starts, Lamini Mall and Kunde aren't tight enough with the overlapping run. And Sunset dives right in for the easy header, makes the run in behind De Young and a tremendous cross in from Nico Williams. Inaki Pena rooted to the spot, trusting his reflexes more than his aerial prowess. He's right to do that. <laughs> that's who he is. But it didn't help in this situation. So that's the 2-2. 60th minute. Now the alarm bell was starting to ring a bit for Barca because here comes Inaki Williams fresh off the AFCON with Ghana. Four. What if for Lamini Mall? As much as Inaki Williams and Nico Williams are now finding the game in the second half, playing off one another, Lamini Mall, that could have been the difference. He was seeing more consistent double teams in the second half, and it didn't seem to matter. 65th minute, the almost moment for Lamini Mall, well, the first almost moment, I should say, Lewandowski sets Lamini Mall on the counter, and with two coming to him and the keeper coming out, the chip was just wide, and what a moment that would have been. If I'm 16, the Galazzo I have, I mean, it doesn't matter what happens after that. It was a great day. And I say that for Lamini Mall. That Galazzo, it was a great day. I know the result didn't happen, but I don't put a Copa del Rey quarterfinal against Athletic Club on the shoulders of a 16-year-old. That's what Xavi had to do and was forced to do and should have done with how good he was because he was the best forward for Barcelona on the day. But it's so frustrating to see him miss that one just for him. And I know how hard the kid is taking it. Nico Williams then also, as I said, started to find himself in that second half. And if Barcelona had won that match, I think Athletic Club fans would have been saying what if for Nico Williams, the same way Barca fans are saying what if for Lamini Mall. 78th minute, Lewandowski off for Chao Felix. His one contribution, that being Lewandowski's, was the goal. He was unhappy to come off this time. You could see it in his face. And he was regularly losing duels on long clearances. Now, it's been two in a row. That feels like bravery by Xavi. But Vita Roque's arrival did not correspond. Even Rafinha's injury has not corresponded to Lewandowski coming off a bit which tells me that is bravery by Xavi to give zero minutes to Vitor Roque and to take Lewandowski off there in the 78th minute tells you a lot about where Lewandowski is and how Xavi feels like this team needs to solve some problems in wide open games. Speaking of wide open, transition opportunity for Athletic Club, it's 3v2. The youngster Unai Gomez does the right thing, but Sunset scuffed it wide and Arau had a goal-saving header knocking it away a minute later. 84th minute, a puzzling moment for me and kind of what summed up, I felt like a rather... Not great performance from Gundogan. Wasn't necessarily a good performance by De Jong either. Wasn't necessarily a great performance from Pedri either. But this was the most telling for Gundogan, who I do think has been playing too much. I wish he could be rotated, but that injury to Gabi and Oro Romeo flopping the way he did, it's killer to Barcelona's depth in the midfield. And very much like Fort, Mark Yu, Lamini Mal, Kabarsi, I know that it feels like the next midfielder is coming, but that next crop of really high potential midfielders that you've heard me talk about in Bernal, in Paul Prim, in Guille Fernandez, they're not ready just yet. The next group of midfielders to come after Gabi, it was supposed to be Gabi, and that next batch isn't ready just yet. So I don't feel like there is a center midfielder that's ready for the first team just yet. So that means that these guys for the rest of the season, especially in Pedri and De Jong and Gundogan, are just going to be, be run to death. Because in the 84th minute, Fort makes the overlapping run. The ball bounces out to Gundogan. And then I don't know why he decided to drive forward. And he lost the ball just too easily today. Not physical enough. Didn't protect it well enough. And it's a wall of athletic club players. And it led to Fort needing to commit the professional foul to stop the counter and pick up the yellow. But while Fort didn't get back or whatever, no, he made the underlapping run. And that yellow for Fort is on Gundogan to put Fort in danger for the rest of that match to maybe pick up a second yellow, which he almost did. 
86th minute, another, I can't believe it, miss by Lamini Mall. Took the ball up Paredes. You able to round the keeper, but he couldn't get it in between the posts. If anything, it feels like he rushed the shot, not knowing when the other center back was coming. It's just frustrating because I know it's going to haunt him, and I wish it didn't because he was excellent today for the second straight match. Late miss foul by the referee on Ferran Torres. I thought the ref did a good job, all things considered. But that mistake, and if Kunde had gone down as well there in the second half, we're talking potentially about a different game. Headline five is Williams and Williams to the semis. Instead of the whistle, this game was, of course, decided by the Williams brothers because we had the extra time. 95th minute, Lamini Mall stops the counter by pulling down Nico Williams, who was off to the races. Then Nico Williams, moments later, misses wide again. 99th minute, Petty had already run himself ragged and should not be pushed physically like this. And so he comes off for Roberto, and that's what the choice was. It was Roberto or Romeo. I mean, yeah, I guess you go with Roberto in that circumstance. You wondered why we didn't see Fermi Lopez or Vitor Roque on for Lamina Mall earlier. I thought that was a move that was going to happen. And I mean, maybe in hindsight, you do Fermi Lopez over Roberto, but maybe Xavi felt like that was just too much youthful exuberance and you need a Roberto. And so while we can question those little minor decisions, I don't think Xavi really had a ton of options. And it was also a good decision by Xavi to leave Ferran Torres on. He could have taken him off for... Jao Felix instead of Lewandowski, but Ferran Torres clearly the fittest of the Barcelona forwards, and he kept running in extra time in ways that his teammates and athletic club players weren't, and he could have been the deciding factor. In that first half of extra time, three solid minutes of possession with Barcelona. They were really patient and finally broke through with a line-breaking pass from Cabarsi, but after all that patience, 105th plus two, the 3-2, Barca finally lose the ball in their own half, and athletic club struck Roberto pushed off the ball, and Via Libre sends Inaki Williams in. Fort had stepped into the midfield and was behind him for the first time all night. He missed the first attempt, that being Inaki Williams, and got the rebound for the goal. This is a bad pass by Kunde. I know Roberto was pushed off, but bad pass by Kunde. And it was a huge mistake not to just blast it into Athletic Club's half of the field and get to that extra time, halftime. I know we're going along here with these five headlines, but this match really had everything to it. Start of the second half of extra time. Mark you on for Lamina Mall. Now you got to go for it. Barcelona is exhausted. And with the patience they had, I really was worried about the legs at that point. Mark you though, gets a chance in 112th, but it's right at the keeper. And then the 113th minute. What a save here by Inaki Pena. Maybe the save of his career, honestly. Fearless with Inaki Williams, trying for the easy tap-in, finally commanding his space, giving Barca a little more belief. And in this match, I think we saw both the highs, that one first half save, and then the save in extra time. We saw the highs, and we saw the lows of Inaki Pena as well, because he continued to struggle to command his box numerous times throughout this game. And then the 4-2 exclamation point, Nico Williams in stoppage time of the second extra time. This is a really good finish too. Everybody for Barcelona was exhausted. They were pushing bodies forward and it's a really good finish, but that match was already over when the third goal was scored. And you felt in that extra time too. It's frustrating as much as would have been sadder to lose on penalties. I'm not sure. But once Pedri and Lamine Mall had run their tanks to empty, Barca had in totality run out of ways forward or, or ways to put the ball in the net. You could feel that at full time, and by the club, with that 12th man, with the SEMMS crowd, they went for it. This is unfortunately Barcelona's last real chance to win a trophy this season, and by the club, they could have lost this game. I mentioned numerous times throughout it where it would have been saying what if, because they were worse when Gurzeta came off the field, but Valverde was patient with his team in extra time. He let them sit in, and then when it was time to press, they did. They got the turnover, got the third goal, and that was it. And listen, Inaki Williams and Nico Williams, they are committed to Athletic Club, and they are two players that every year, every other club, especially in Spain, is going, why can't we just pry those kids, especially Nico Williams? Boy, oh boy, would he be awesome for Barcelona on that left wing. But those are things that are just dreams, because Barcelona will never be able to afford the transfer fee that Athletic Club, and this is before the extension even. So now that you sign the extension, yeah, impossible. My big takeaway as I sum up this five headlines, I am proud of the performance that Barcelona put in. But as we know, there are many in this fan base. And if you're listening here, you're probably not one of them. But there are many in this fan base that judge success by trophies and not progress. And I do think that this week for Barcelona and Xavi was progress. But now their only two opportunities are to have an historic comeback in the Liga table and win the Liga again or shock the world beyond all shocks. I know Barcelona, the average football fan, doesn't feel like the underdogs, but 
They are underdogs with the way they're playing this season in the Champions League. And winning the Champions League, that could save Xavi's job for the summer. So I think throughout the rest of this season, we're just about halfway through. But because the Spanish Super Cup and Copa del Rey have slipped through their fingers, I think we're going to be talking about for the rest of this season, whether or not Xavi will be continuing on this summer. Thank you for sitting here for my longest five headlines in Barcelona podcast history. Congratulations to you for making it to the end. I've been saying I did want to do a giveaway. So that reminds me, I'm going to be doing a giveaway of some merch in the near future. So if you're here on the show, I tell you, always subscribe to stuff so you don't miss any of that stuff because after this, you definitely deserve it. I'll talk to you late on Sunday after Villarreal. And until then, as always, Force of Barca. Barca.